point is that it, what the Biden administration needs to do is something huge or propose is something huge that will produce that political explosion that will then provoke that conversation, that national discussion about the role of the court, about the power of the court. Do we want to have nine unelected people basically ruling our country as if they are kings and queens? Welcome to the Politics Girl podcast. I'm your host, Lee McGowan. Let's get into it. Today's pod is a candid conversation with Tom Hartman. Tom has the number one progressive talk show in America with over 7 million weekly listeners, is a New York Times bestselling author of 25 books in the fields of psychiatry, ecology, politics, and economics. He's a former psychotherapist, businessman, and progressive political commentator who has co-written and starred in four documentaries with Leonardo DiCaprio on environmentalism. I'm having Tom on the show today, not because his resume is so stellar, but because his brain is. His substack, The Hartman Report, is one of the smartest sources of information out there. I learned so much from him, and I'm having him on today so you can too. This episode drops on Election Day in America. The 2022 midterms are arguably the most important election in the history of our republic, because not only are the candidates on the ballot, democracy itself is on the line. Whether or not your vote will continue to count is decided today. Whether women will have human rights and bodily autonomy protected by our leaders, or whether those who can become pregnant are controlled by the state, no longer able to make decisions for their own lives or their own welfare. This is the election that decides if Social Security and Medicare are protected or if they're vulnerable, and if the planet itself has a fighting chance. And yet there are people out there today who believe this election is about gas prices or inflation who believe the nation is failing despite all evidence to the contrary, or people who will simply vote to hold those who aren't like them back. However it goes, there will be a tomorrow, and we will need to make a plan for what comes next. I'm trusting in the American people. I hope enough of us know enough to vote for a future that includes democracy. But even with that win, we still have a lot of work to do moving forward. So without further ado, please welcome my guest, radio personality, best-selling author, and all-around brilliant genius, Tom Hartman. Welcome, Tom. Thanks, Lee. It's great to be here with you. I love the podcast. I'm so pleased to be on it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I love doing it. It's so engaging for me to be talking to some of these people that I just admire so much. I'm also very happy to be speaking with you because I was trying to figure out what I was going to do on election day because I feel stressed and I need perspective, but I... I know I should be feeling hopeful. I know that the values I believe in have the majority sentiment in the country. I know that the reversal of Roe woke millions of people up to the Republicans' plan for the country and that this Make America Great Again concept wasn't just a slogan, but really a roadmap, a plan to take us back to a time before women's rights, before civil rights, maybe even before the New Deal, to a time when in America where It worked for certain people and the rest of us worked for them. And so it makes me nervous that that group might gain power again because so much is on the line. So how are you feeling about the way this election is going to shake out? Well, I'm concerned. You know, obviously uh, we have multiple states now that have been essentially transported back to the 1830s to the 1850s, you know, to that era when the Southern slave states were by 1830 had altogether ceased to be democracies. Um, arguably, they weren't up to that point, you know, given the extensive disenfranchisement of African Americans and, and women. But um, in the 1830s, as a consequence of the, of the widespread use of the cotton gin, they had they had the large plantation owners that just wiped out all the smaller cotton planters and, and bought up their farms and turned them into sharecroppers. And so even white people who dared speak out against the white power structure in in Georgia, South Carolina, Florida, you know, in, the, in, in that whole stretch were frequently lynched, um, tortured, uh, you know, dragged behind carts to death. Uh, You know, that that, that sort of stuff was fairly common in the South. It was a real fascist police state. And, you know, they looked at us uh, in the North and, and, and said, and I say us, I mean, I I lived in Georgia for 13 years, but, um, you know, they, they looked up here at the North and said, this is a threat to us, this whole idea of democracy, because, you know, they may force us to free our slaves and they may force us to share power, et cetera. And frankly, I think that, you know, that that is a model that has never been abandoned by many white people in those states. And it's a model that's being brought back of oligarchy rather than democracy. And I think most Americans don't realize that there was a period of time in the United States where uh, even though we were still holding relatively free and fair elections in the North, at least for white men, 
they were not in the South. They were holding performances. And, you know, if you didn't vote the right way, you, you could be in big trouble and uh, or you, you know, your vote simply didn't count. So. Yeah, which is kind of what we're looking at again today. We're looking at a exactly. resurgence of that exact thing. Yeah, they're trying to bring it back. This is this is the world that they're trying to take us back to. It's fascism and patriarchy always go hand in hand. Misogyny and fascism all go always go hand in hand. I don't know what the deep psychology of it is. I, you know, I mean, and we could speculate. I, um, these are generally very insecure, very damaged men. Certainly, Adolf Hitler and Donald Trump are and were. Um, and uh, who had uh, women in their lives that they desperately wanted the approval of. Hitler's mother was uh, fairly terrible toward him, although she protected him from his father, who was even worse. And Trump's mother, you know, uh, from the time he was eight or nine years old, sent him off to military school, except for the summers. And during the summers, she went to Scotland all alone and left him with, uh, with dad, who completely ignored him. So, uh, you know, he grew up damaged in that regard. But I mean, for to be so widespread, it's got to be something more than just that kind of specific stuff. But um, but racism and misogyny are just this. This is the fuel that these people run on. It's a, it's going to be a real challenge. Yeah, it's alarming. It's really alarming because you are seeing it grow, and you see these men, these kind of strong men types, these uh, Hitler esque, Trump esque. You see them trying to grow in the DeSantis, in the Abbots, even in women like Carrie Lake. It's the same sentiment. This like I alone can fix it. Let me take control. I've got it all under control. And if you question them or if you stand up to them, you're in major trouble. And the problem is, is that there's enough people that seem to be going along with it. There's enough people running in this election that are election deniers, knowing full well that that's not the case at all. You know, we're going to see a whole big thing today about you know, the red mirage and did more people vote, you know, today on ballots and which ballots count and which ballots don't count. And we have to remember there's people running to count the votes that don't even believe in counting the votes properly. And we have people running for secretary of state that say that only Republicans will win in their state. Or we have people saying they're going to refuse to concede today. And it's alarming. I mean, I look at the elections that are going to come out today, you know, insurrectionists like Doug Mastriano, Carrie Lake, AGs like Ken Paxton. I mean, he's already messed with the votes. Senate candidates like Herschel Walker or Amendment Oz, who are clearly just plants for a guaranteed vote in the Senate. Governor candidates like Brian Kemp in Georgia, who's already suppressed votes many times and continues to do so. And people like Mike DeWine running for governor in Ohio, who's so deeply corrupt. It's amazing he's still on the ballot. And I don't know what we do if these people become our leaders, you know, more... Marjorie Taylor Greens and less Katie Porters. I think it's alarming for people. And it, it's, you know, we're sitting at such a crossroad. Yeah, they're trying to turn America into Mississippi. And, and the, the strategy that they're using is one that Steve Bannon laid out. And we've heard it now we've, in, in a meeting with private co-conspirators or donors or whatever it was just before the January 6th election. In fact, I think it was a month before the November 2020 election. I think it was a month or so before that. You know, where he said, you know, Trump is simply going to declare that he won. They set it up. You know, they 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 talked they trash talked mail in ballots continuously so that they knew that the day of election returns would be predominantly Republican. And then the next day, the mail in ballots being counted would be predominantly Democratic. And and they've actually passed laws like in Pennsylvania, where it's against the law to even open the mail in ballots until after all of the day of ballots are counted. So, you know, it rolls over to the second day. And this is purely, it's like performance art. It's purely so that they can say, see, somebody's stealing your vote. You know, it's, it, it, what about all those votes that came in at two o'clock in the morning? Well, those were the votes that, you know, you, you said we had to count later. Yeah. So I, I am expecting that today we're going to get some, some probably solid results from most states, but, and maybe enough to, to know whether the House and Senate will stay in Democratic hands. But frankly, I think it's going to take probably a week or so to yeah. clean this whole mess up because you're going to have all these election challenges. You're going to have all these court challenges. They're already planning to take stuff to the Supreme Court. We know from two years ago that they were planning on using Clarence Thomas. You know, his wife just danced into the January 6th committee and, and proclaimed that, yes, uh, you know, Joe Biden wasn't legitimately elected. And, and uh, you know, if she's still talking like that. Clarence is certainly still talking like that. And it's going to be a tough time. The, 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 the thing that I hope doesn't happen, you know, when the stakes are much, much higher in 2024, I'm fully expecting is, is political violence. Yeah. And we'll just have to hold our breath on that.
Yeah, we will. I think provided we keep our heads above water right now, provided democracy keeps its head above water in this election, I think we have a far better chance of handling 2024 better because we have two years to prepare for it. And I know that's what I'm planning to do. So let's go with the assumption that the Democrats are able to retain the House and keep the Senate and maybe even with any luck expand the Senate by a couple of votes so we can deal with the filibuster. We aren't done. You know, there's... A lot of things that we need to deal with immediately. A lot of problems in America needs to tackle. The most glaring one, as you just mentioned, Clarence Thomas, is the Supreme Court, which appears to be so deeply compromised that that's the first thing we need to address. Because ultimately, it doesn't matter what laws we pass if the far right majority keeps undermining or overruling those laws, because laws only mean something because we collectively agree they mean something. If six unelected people with a clear agenda and lack of respect for precedent continue to overrule this collective will of the people, how long until we start to see them as illegitimate and subsequently start to see the laws that they rule on or laws themselves as illegitimate? I think the big the big challenge with the Supreme Court with regard to the legitimacy of the court is that, as you pointed out, Lee, that that you know they're they're just overturning precedent. They're 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 not even giving good justifications in many cases. The whole shadow docket thing. Um, I the the tragedy is that I don't think most Americans are paying attention. I know. Um, you know, you talk about the court and it just goes right over people's heads. And uh, in fact, most people don't even really understand how the court works. I, I, I would be surprised if more than 10% of Americans understand the difference, you know, what ju- judicial supremacy is or judicial yeah. review. Um, you know, these are just concepts that we all should know. But, you know, since the Reagan revolution stripped civics out of our schools, you know, and I mean, the rationale was that we need to learn science and math, right? <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I think civics is pretty damn important stuff. and and. So we've got a lot of uninformed people. It's why, you know, it's the, the work that you're doing is so important, you know, reaching out to people. And with regard to the legitimacy of the law, that's a just a huge can of worms because, the you know, then you get into the question of, well, we know how the laws are made, right? You know, they have to originate in the House. They get passed through the, the out, out of the House, passed by the Senate. The si- president signs it into law. But then who decides what's constitutional and what's not? Um, you know, f- f- up until 1803, the Supreme Court did not decide that. It was not deciding that. It was up to Congress and the president to, to basically declare what was constitutional and what wasn't. In 1803, when the Supreme Court in the Marbury versus Madison case ruled that they could strike down a law, in this case, it was part of the Federal Judiciary Act of 1797, President Jefferson went nuts. You know, he said under, uh, you know, uh, under this doctrine, the constitution has become a thing of wax that can be molded in the hands of the judiciary and an unelected branch of government at that. He said, this is judicial tyranny. I mean, he just went on a tear. He went on. He wasn't wrong. Jefferson was not wrong. I agree. I I mean, literally he wasn't wrong. I keep saying to you, and I was going to ask you today, like, There's a lot of people who don't understand the courts. Absolutely. And I completely agree with you. I say this all the time. People shouldn't feel bad if they don't understand government because civics was taken out of schools for a reason. It is easier to control us if we don't understand. And every two years, we're trotted out to vote for people we don't understand and things we don't know. And we shouldn't feel too bad about it, mostly because it was done deliberately. It was a plan, right? And who does that serve if we're not talking about it, if we don't understand? It doesn't serve us, the people. It doesn't serve democracy. It serves the people in power and the moneyed interests that are in charge. And so I was thinking like, how did the Supreme Court get this much power, right? And then I'm reading your Substack, and I'm like, there's literally nothing in the Constitution that gives the Supreme Court the exclusive right to decide what the Constitution says or what it means or impose its rules on the other branches of governments. Pretty much- In fact, the opposite. Yes, I know. Congress is in charge of the court, not the court in charge of Congress. And Congress makes the laws and the court is supposed to be like the last appellate, you know, justice, but not to rule on all of our constitutional laws, right? And so- What you're talking about from 1803, pretty much everything they're doing right now in 2022 is based on the power the court gave itself in a case. I want to say it's called Maybury versus Madison. Mulberry versus Madison. Mulberry versus Madison, right? So they gave themselves the right to overturn laws. And then Congress, and I think the president agreed at the time. Is that right? 
No, it, it, well, it didn't require any agreement, but the, okay. in 18, they just gave themselves that that right. Thomas Jefferson was president and he went just batshit crazy about this. I mean, you know, he was furious. And, uh, and, and by the way, so is the rest of the country. I mean, there were yeah. editorials and papers all over the country. You had a kind of a united uh, political stance against this. This was an issue that in 1787 in Philadelphia in the Constitutional Convention was actually debated. You can find it in Madison's notes. You know, there, there was, uh, I think it was Governor Morris who was saying, you know, that the, the Supreme Court should be the final, uh, final arbiter of what the Constitution means. And, and the debate was, but wait a minute, who, you know, should, should we be giving that kind of a power to an unelected branch? And, and, and the other argument was the argument that Jefferson made, um, at, you know, when he, he, he wrote this long rant about, about how screwed up the uh, Marbury decision was in 1803 to a friend of his who wrote back, saying, well, if the court doesn't decide what the Constitution means, who does? And Jefferson's answer was the same as the answer that I believe it was George Mason gave back in 1787 at the Constitutional Convention. It was literally, quote, the people themselves, end quote. And that's why uh, Larry Kramer, who was the dean of the, uh, of the Stanford Law School for years and years and years, wrote a book called The People Themselves, about this issue of judicial supremacy and, and judicial review about, uh, you know, and, but this so badly, Jefferson's reaction so badly burned uh, the, the, the fingers of the, of the guys on the court and particularly John Marshall, who was Jefferson's third cousin and, and bitter enemy. They, they hated each other throughout their entire lives, which is why John Adams put him on the court just two weeks before Adams had to turn the reins over to Jefferson. <laughs> he just did it to mess with them. Absolutely. Absolutely. And <laughs> bragged about it to his friends. And, and uh, so anyhow, you know, Jefferson going nuts about this, uh, you know, the president of the United States, um, so kind of inflamed the issue that the Supreme Court didn't again try to strike down a law saying that they knew what the Constitution meant. They didn't do that again until 1856. Yeah. And in 1856, when they tried it for the second time, and all the, all the original guys were dead then, right? They tried it for the second time, and that was when Roger Taney was, or Taney was the uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and he thought, and he was a Southern slaveholder, and he thought he would solve the problem of slavery once and for all. And so in the Dred Scott decision, he said, you know, the Constitution says that Black people aren't fully human beings. They're the property of white people. So even in, in the North, even in Illinois and Massachusetts, all those Black people up there, they're the property of some white person, and that white person could just go grab them and say, hey, you're mine now. And what did Congress do? Congress said, "Screw that! You yeah, know, we're, we're not going to we're not going to go along with this." I know. And, Lincoln and ignored Lincoln, Lincoln ignored their decision. Congress ignored their decision, and they just went ahead, right? And they well, freed so, the- sort of. I, you know, Lincoln and Congress acknowledged the decision in as much as it applied to uh, Mr. Scott, right? In, in fact, Lincoln said, "You know, it's a terrible thing for Mr. Scott." But, you know, we're not going to apply it to everybody else. In other words, this is not a precedent. It's merely one case. And they recognized the Supreme Court's being the final court of appeals that that um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting the names of the people who participated in that law school, uh, lawsuit suit. Forgive me. Well, but, none of um, us will know. So that's fine. You can talk yeah, in generalities. But, but uh, <laughs> the fellow bringing the, scoot, the suit was a very light skinned black man who thought that he would that there would be some, you know, basically, you know, white privilege associated with that. Um, as I recall, this was out of Missouri and, you know, and the court ruled against him and it went up to the Supreme Court and they ruled against him. So, so Lincoln said, okay, you know, we're not going to try and free Mr. Scott, but that's it. You know, that, that's it. That's the end of your jurisdiction. And, you know, but then by the 1880s, the court started doing this fairly regularly. Yeah. And this was largely at the insistence of the railroad barons, yeah. but um, the court, you know, it used to be called the chickens and dogs court, you know, because America was rural. I mean, this was back in the founding generation time. And most of the cases that the court was looking at were, you know, this farmer's dog ate that farmer's chicken. And it goes back and forth through the courts until finally somebody's got to say who's responsible. And, and you know, the buck stops at the Supreme Court. But uh, in the last 70 years or so, you know, largely since the, since the New Deal, in particular, when the Lochner court started striking down as unconstitutional, Pretty much everything Franklin Roosevelt wanted to do, which provoked that huge crisis of uh, 1937 when he was going to pack the court. Yeah, he was going to expand um, it. 
yeah, from, from that point until today, basically the court has been doing nothing but ruling based on the Constitution. Again, like you said, Lee, a power that the Constitution does not give them. No, it doesn't give them. And the thing is, is that, you know, I think I'm paying attention to what the court is doing. Um, but I was recently reading an article about today's court, about this far right activist court that we're looking at now. And I was reading your Substack, and it, by the way, everyone should to go to the Hartman Report, which I highly recommend people uh, subscribe to because I've learned so much just reading Tom's writings. But some of the decisions that this far right activist court has made just this year alone to undermine democracy and its institutions. I'd like to get the listeners up to speed because when I read it, I felt like I was paying attention. I thought, holy hell, all in the same year. So do you mind if I just read some of your own work back to you? Please do, because I don't remember the list right off the top. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so just this year, this Supreme Court, the Trump activist justices, the six far right justices, have ended the Sixth Amendment right for prisoners to challenge convictions when their lawyers were corrupt or incompetent. So they can't challenge that anymore. They've gutted Americans' right to vote, endorsing three separate Republican gerrymanders in Wisconsin, Louisiana, and Alabama, each one that was clearly drawn to enhance the electoral power of white voters. They have removed the rights of U.S. citizens who move or live in Puerto Rico to get Social Security. They made it so Americans can no longer sue police officers who fail to read them their Miranda rights. They have eliminated the rights offered to many non-citizens so they can't be abused by our federal government. They, uh, Those same six right-wing justices ruled that Border Patrol and any other federal officers can search you, your home, your vehicle without warrant for any reason if they think you're suspicious, if you live near the border or the ocean. So they not only remove people's Fourth Amendment rights against unreasonable search and seizure, they did it for anyone who lives within 100 miles of the ocean or a border, which turns out to be two in three Americans, right? So two in three Americans just lost their right to unreasonable search and seizure. They've given police officers who use excessive force immunity from accountability, making it basically impossible to sue a cop if they beat or kill you for no reason. Um, And along with overturning Roe, which we all saw happen, they also overturned another 50 years of precedent by giving polluters the power to overrule states and indigenous tribe rules against polluting. So basically, killing the power of the EPA under the Clean Air Act to regulate the health of our air and water. And this is like, I mean, when you see it all together, you just go, okay, this isn't sustainable, right? And that was last year. That was just last year. That was before they started this shenanigans with the affirmative action. And, you know, this more this more v. Harper case, which is coming up and we need to talk about. But it's just such a blatant attack on American democracy, such a blatant attack on the rights of the average American citizen that I, I'm not sure how we're supposed to move forward with this. I, 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 I was hoping that the Dobbs decision would produce a national conversation about this. Um, You know, uh, there certainly was a national conversation in the 1950s about this. And uh, after the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education decision, um, that kicked off the John Birch Society's real aggressive actions. That's when Fred Koch started pouring money into the John Birch Society and they started putting up impeach Earl Warren signs all over the country, billboards. And and there was a lot of discussion. I mean, I, I, I grew up in the 60s and and I, mean, I was I was born before that decision. I was born in fifty one, but um, I, you know, obviously, I wasn't paying attention in fifty four. But but by the sixties, I, I you know I was, and and, and um, that you had you know William F. Buckley, and you had these you know these kind of conservative intellectuals back then who were making the argument that I'm I've been you and I have been talking about right now that you know how did the court rule that you know, schools have to be integrated when the when the, you know the Constitution never gave them that power, and then you know there was this period of maybe four or five years where there was actually a national conversation about the court having too much power and the court kind of, you know, just, well, they reaffirmed Brown two years later, but, but, you know, they kind of kept their heads down. And then the same thing happened in 73 with Roe v. Wade, actually 73, 74 and 75, there was almost no debate. There was very little fury around Roe v. Wade. It really started picking up in 76. Yeah. Because it was was a, it was a, it was, Deliberate. It wasn't even really about Roe v. Wade. It was about it was opportunist preachers. Yeah, desegregating schools, really. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, you know Jerry Falwell starting his white academies and all this stuff. And yeah, but 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 with regard to Roe v. Wade, with regard to abortion, that was just a, a topic that 
I mean, you know, uh, Reagan was in favor of the right to abortion. He signed the most liberal abortion law in the United States as governor of, of California. George Herbert Walker Bush was, you know, in favor of uh, he, his wife, I, I believe, Barbara, was on the board of Planned Parenthood. If not, they were big financial supporters of it and public supporters of it. But they all changed in 1980 in that election because George W. Bush, their their religious advisor, their their liaison to the religious community, got together with Ralph Reed and the and uh, uh, Jerry Falwell, uh, you know, and and those guys, and and said, hey, you know, let's let's pick up this. And 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 the Protestant churches at that time were entirely in favor of the right to choose to have an abortion. Um, the only church that wasn't was the Catholic Church, but they all decided that this was an issue that they could use to beat people up with. And then throughout the 80s, and there's a whole, there's an amazing chapter about this in my book on the Supreme Court. During the 80s, uh, Ronald Reagan hired this, this young lawyer into the Justice Department and said, figure out a way to overturn Brown v. Board and Roe v. Wade. I can't stack the court. I can't expand the court. I don't have enough power in Congress to do that. How do we overturn these decisions? And that young lawyer wrote this 27-page or 29-page brief. And I think when I found it, it was probably the first time it had ever been like publicly waved around in which he goes back to the Marbury decision. He says the Jefferson was absolutely right that he, he, he documents how, you know, when the court tried to say that the trail of tears, to, you know, that, that uh, Andrew Jackson was doing was a terrible thing that Andrew Jackson just said, screw you to the court. That when the court said that the second national bank was, was okay. Andrew Jackson said, no, I've decided it's unconstitutionally killed it the Dred Scott decision you and I just talked about a moment ago, that was the conversation. And, 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 and so the conclusion that this young lawyer came to was we need to introduce legislation that invokes Article 3, Section 2 of the Constitution that says that the Supreme Court shall operate under regulations and according to exceptions defined by Congress. And we need to introduce legislation that says the Supreme Court may not rule on the racial integration of schools or on abortion. And by the way, this law is reversing, officially reversing those two decisions. That never happened. Reagan took that very, very seriously and ultimately decided that he just didn't have the political power to do it. and He wasn't willing to die on that hill. But that young lawyer's name was John Roberts. Yeah. <laughs> but I think, you know, what? I think it's worth having the discussion, right? Like, I think it's worth having the discussion that we go back in time, should the Supreme Court be able to rule on these constitutional things? Do they have this power? And you might say, well, Oli, I don't want to have that conversation because that means we're going to reverse Brown v. Board of Education. That means we're going to reverse gay marriage. That means we're going to reverse Roe. That means we're... And you go, okay, but maybe they should never have been decided by the court in the first place. Maybe they should have been decided by Congress. We should have always had a law that codified Roe into law. We shouldn't be begging the court to give women in America the right to their own body. That should be a law in a country like America. There should be a law that says you can't, you know, segregate your schools. There should be a law that says marry who you want. It shouldn't all come down to nine appointed people. Like maybe that's a conversation worth having. Yeah. And, and, you know, I remember 1973 and, and uh, I believe I had this conversation with Gloria Steinem a year or so ago on my program. Um, and my apologies to her if I'm misremembering who it was. My recollection of 73 was that movement against abortion rights did not really begin then. It, it began later. But that what the Supreme Court decision did was it took all the wind out of the sails of the national women's rights movement, in at least with regard to this is this issue, in 1961 the birth control pill was legalized by the FDA. That kicked off the the free love of the 60s, where you know people felt free to have a lot of sex, and 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 that that led then you know in 1965 the Supreme Court legalized in the Griswold decision in Connecticut legalized birth control in a in a in a married couple's home, but it was still illegal for individuals. And single people got the right, again, by the Supreme Court, got the right to have birth control in 72. And then, you know, in 73, you had the Supreme Court dealing with Roe v. Wade. Well, frankly, that stuff should have been done. I mean, the, the court made those decisions. The court very often is a weather vane reflecting popular opinion. Not always, obviously. And right obviously now, not but, now. <laughs> yeah. but very often, certainly in the 70s, it was, it, was, it was making, I mean, most of the people on the court at that point in time were, were, had been appointed by Franklin Roosevelt. There, that was still a fairly reasonable court, shall we say. Yeah. And so what the court did is by nailing these things down, 
they basically took the wind out of the sails of that movement. And, and thus, we didn't get the law that we really needed that would have prevented the Dobbs decision. Yeah. And so, yeah, we need to go back to, to Congress making laws. And, and, and if the people think that Congress has made a law that's out, you know, outrageous or egregious or you know, uh, wrong or unconstitutional, then you vote that Congress out. Exactly. That's how it's supposed to work. They're supposed to, which takes us to money, but I will come back to that because I don't want to pass over the Supreme Court without talking about this upcoming case they have, Moore v. Harper, because I think no matter how today's election goes, Moore v. Harper will dictate what happens in 24, and we can't pretend it's not happening. We have to have our eyes wide open to this case going before the Supreme Court because it could essentially upend elections as we know them and make it literally impossible for a Democrat to win the presidency. So do you want to walk me through this case just so people know sure. the broad strokes of it? Yeah, I was just looking looking around for my constitution. Um, I don't have it. So I'm, I'm going to have to do this from memory. Um, there I think is, you can do that. I have faith in you. <laughs> actually, it'll, it'll, it'll be rough. Um, <laughs> there, I, I, I believe it's Article 4 of the Constitution. But uh, in any case, in the Constitution, it says that the, uh, the individual states shall determine how and under what circumstances their electoral college votes for president of the United States are chosen and transmitted to Washington, D.C. There's a, I believe there's a date specified, but beyond that. And, and, and basically, the state legislatures have final say. Now, the end of that sentence, which is almost never quoted when you hear conservatives quoting this. Yeah, it's like when they do the that, Second Amendment. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. It, it, yes, it, it, absolutely. The end of that sentence is that, however, Congress may define rules as they choose. Right. So they said, OK, the states, you guys can figure out how you're going to do the electoral votes. But if it gets out of line, we can pass a law. You know, that's what the Constitution says. But forget about that last part, because this whole theory that John Eastman has been promoting and that you know, I wrote, I wrote about this, you know, in March of 2020, saying that this is what Donald Trump was going to do. Yeah. And but everyone needs to remember that John Eastman that you're talking about is the same John Eastman totally caught up in the insurrection, caught up in the stop the steal, caught up in trying to do the whole coup with Donald Trump. He's He's the lawyer that's caught up in all of that. And he was a clerk for Clarence Thomas, worked <laughs> side by side with him for years. And is a good Jimmy <sighs> Thomas. So, I mean, you know, yeah, there, there we go. So, so anyway, the argument that these conservatives are making and that they will be making before the Supreme Court is that because the, the federal constitution says the states can choose their electors any old way they want, if in Georgia, Donald Trump lost by 11,000 votes, the legislature can simply say, yeah, so what? We like Donald Trump, we'll send our electors to him. Basically negating, it will negate the will of the voters in states in which Republican legislatures control the power, right? That's I mean, right. And Republicans control the legislatures in 30 states right now. Yeah. So, so that kind of takes 30 states out of the running to send Democratic electors. So if this case goes through, it basically says voters don't determine who becomes president via the Electoral College, but individual state legislatures have the power to award their electoral votes to whoever they want. And, and the governors can't veto it. Yeah. No, I mean, that's, that's the thing. I mean, the, governor. the, the, it, the governors can't veto it. It can't be appealed to any court. It can't be appealed to the Supreme Court. No one has control except the Republican control, controlled state legislatures um, yeah. who will then choose who they want for president as opposed yeah. to going with the will of the voter. So legal experts, even very conservative legal experts have pointed out that if this idea is adopted by the Supreme Court, it could very well signal the end of Democratic presidents, right? And that's a major problem, right? Because what would that do to our presidential elections? I mean, Democrats would simply be shut out of the presidency, even though they have the majority sentiment in the country and they win the popular vote every year. Like, how long does that last without people pushing back? I mean, there are people pushing back now before the case is even decided. You write that the independent state legislature theory, which is at the core of this case, has people like Judge Michael Ludig, who's the conservative judge who personally ran Clarence Thomas's Supreme Court hearing and worked for years with John Roberts and the Reagan Justice Department. He says this entire idea is antithetical to the framers intent, the text of the constitution and the fundamental design and architecture of our country, right? But does that even matter to this court, right? Do they even care? 
They say they're originalists, but they're originalists until they're not, right? They're operatives. So Republicans are already talking about state legislatures legally handing, legally handing the 2024 election to a Trump or a DeSantis, regardless of who actually won. And they won't need an insurrection that time, right? Because it'll be legal. Yep. And, you know, in keeping with that part of the Constitution, um, every state has already passed laws. I mean, way back in the in the early 1800s, by the 1820s, basically every state had come into compliance with this. They had passed laws determining how their electoral college votes would be uh, apportioned. And uh, all 48 of our states now, I mean, back then it was fewer states, but 48 states say that whoever wins the majority of the vote in the state the state will award their electoral votes to the candidate that, you know, won that majority. Um, Nebraska, I believe it is, and uh, Maine split their states in half and they, they do it as if it was two states. Um, But same deal. And uh, you know, what, what has happened now is you've got several states that have passed legislation that arguably uh, asserts that the state legislature doesn't even have to change that law that they can simply determine you know, uh, if they choose, if they decide to, to insert themselves in the, in, the, in the case, that they can simply choose to send their electoral votes to whoever lost, if they choose. Yeah, I, I mean, we have not had, the United States has not had a, Demo, a Republican president elected by the majority of the people, initially elected by the majority of the people, since 1988. The last Republican who was actually elected, brought into office by a majority of the people, was George Herbert Walker Bush. Yeah. And George W. Bush lost in 2000 by about 500,000 votes. Donald Trump lost in 2016 by 3 million votes. Uh, w. Bush uh, won his re-election, but that's not the initial, you know, that wasn't the door that got him in. No. And uh, so the, the Republicans are looking at the fact that they probably are not going to hold the White House for a long, long time because the vast majority of the country doesn't like Republicans. And, you know, numerically, but they do control the majority of the states. So if they yeah. can get the Supreme Court to give the power to award the presidency to the states rather than to the voters, you know, it's it's George W. Bush and Donald Trump forever. Yeah, and it's a total game changer. And I think that's why we need to get really serious about what's going on in the courts, because ultimately it's the courts that are going to make these decisions. And they're working right now with completely unchecked power. Okay, okay. This is all very alarming. Let's take a quick break to thank the sponsors who made this show possible, and we'll be right back after this with Tom Hartman. Politics Girl has a new sponsor, Lomi by Pila. I was so excited when Lomi approached us because I love products that help the world, and Pila already makes the biodegradable phone cases, so I knew they were a good company. Like you, I'm one of those people who wants to do better by the planet, but isn't exactly sure how to go about it. I feel like we make so much garbage in my house. We recycle like crazy, but there's so much food waste. Between family meals, the dog rejecting his food, and having a teenage boy, I feel like I'm not doing my part to help the environment. I know when food waste breaks down in landfills, it creates a large amount of methane that's released and is terrible for the environment. California passed a law to have compost, but I'm not exactly thrilled with the gross container of dead food underneath our sink. I mean, I'll do it, but I'm just not thrilled with it. This is where Lomi comes in. Lomi is a countertop electric composter that turns food scraps into dirt in under four hours. There's no smell when it runs and it's totally quiet. I can't tell you how excited I am to use this. I'll be able to turn our food waste into nutrient rich dirt that I can feed to my plants, put in the garden, or just throw in the trash. I love companies who think, what can I do to help the world? How can I make doing the right thing easier for people? And the Lomi is just sitting there on my counter looking all cute and ready to break down everything from banana peels to meat without any damage to the environment. Food waste makes up a huge portion of our personal carbon footprint, and Lomi is going to allow our family to cut that way down. So if you want to join me and start making a positive impact on the environment or just make cleaning up after dinner that much easier, Lomi is perfect for you. Head to lomi.com slash politicsgirl and use the promo code politicsgirl to get $50 off your Lomi. That's $50 off when you head to lomi.com slash politicsgirl and use promo code politicsgirl at checkout. Food waste is gross. It's bad for the environment and Lomi is the solution. And with the holidays just around the corner, Lomi is the perfect gift for anyone on your shopping list. We can do better. Lomi is showing us how. 
I haven't talked about Athletic Greens in a couple of weeks and I was starting to feel sad. Athletic Greens has been such a great partner for this show and I rave about them all the time because it's helped everyone from my family to my friends to listeners who have tried it and written me to let me know. I talk about Athletic Greens all the time, but if you don't know, Athletic Greens was created when the founder was experiencing a ton of gut health issues and ended up on a complicated supplement routine trying to recover. The supplement routine was costing him about $100 a day. So we created Athletic Greens as a way for people to get optimal nutrition on their own without that huge price point. He also found that regular supplements didn't always absorb into your body properly. So we wanted to find a way to give people the most value out of what they were ingesting. Athletic Greens is lifestyle friendly. However you eat, keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, gluten-free, it all fits in. It contains less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs, no chemicals, no artificial anythings. With one scoop of Athletic Greens, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics and adaptogens to help start your day off right. It helps your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, energy, recovery, focus, aging. It also helps sleep. I've noticed such a difference with sleep. Now is the time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition, which is especially important heading into cold and flu season. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is gonna give you one free year of immune supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash politicsgirl. Again, that's athleticgreens dot com slash politics girl to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate in daily nutrition. I wouldn't keep talking about this if I didn't truly believe in it. Give it a try. You're not going to be disappointed. So how do you think we should handle this? Like, is it expansion? Is it other means? Um, if we want to continue to function as a democracy and believe in the rule of law, um, because this would be so incredibly undemocratic, I can't even fathom. Um, what do you think we should be doing to sort, sort out this problem? I think, it, it, Lee, that's that's the $64,000 question. I mean, right? it, yeah. you've, you've got intersecting questions of practicality. You know, what can we actually do? Yeah, what can we actually do? What, I mean, people have so many ideas, but it's well, like, you can't do this because it's in the Constitution. Lifetime appointment's in the Constitution. So you can't just suddenly say you get 15 years. It's just not possible without well, changing the Constitution. Can you how? Um, the, the What the Constitution says is that all federal judges have lifetime tenure. Right. It doesn't say that you're, the court that you're on, you have lifetime tenure on that court. So what could easily be done is that after 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, whatever, members of the Supreme Court would have to leave the Supreme Court and go back to the circuit courts that they used to be on before they were appointed to the Supreme Court, for example. So, so clever. So you could say you have a lifetime appointment to the courts, but not to the Supreme Court. the federal court. branch. That's right. Right. That's okay. Right. So, but, you know, the challenge is like, when I said, what can we do? I wasn't thinking so much in terms of what's legal to do, because that's, you know, hugely debatable. Like I said earlier, you know, Congress could pass a law saying no Supreme Court, you can't do that. But, you know, that hasn't happened in our 240 plus year history. And because it, it would just create a, an explosion. I mean, it would be a genuine constitutional crisis. But are I, we not I in a constitutional crisis? Exactly. I would now. love to see it happen. I, you know, yeah. there, there, were, there were nearly 100 laws introduced in 1981 when the Republicans took control with the Reagan revolution. Almost 100 laws that, that included court stripping provisions in them. Yeah. Most having to do with Roe and Brown versus Board, um, but not all of them. And there have been a couple of laws that have been passed. Uh, uh, one that uh, uh, Tom, oh, I'm forgetting, forgetting his last name. He was the governor of Iowa and then he was a senator. Um, but anyhow, he wrote that law. It had to do with grain, um, but it had a provision in it that said the Supreme Court can't rule on this. It's just been largely ignored. Yeah. But um, well, I know, mean, we it, have to be honest that the Republicans are way better at playing this game than than Democrats. They have a much better long term planning. They are more willing to bend things to their will while staying within the realm of legality. Um, and when people talk about playing fire with fire, I think this is what we should be talking about, where we use the law to reflect the will of the people instead of just the will of the party, which is what the Republicans have done. I mean, personally, I think we should be expanding the court, but I think we should be expanding it quite extensively. I think we should be diluting the power of each individual Supreme Court justice a lot. I think we'd be able to hear more cases. I think we'd be able to pick at random so you don't know which justice you're working with from case to case. You don't know who is going to have 
what case. So you can't just bring the Dobbs case because you know what the votes are going to be. You don't even know what justices you're going to get. I think they should be picking at random who they work with and what cases they get. Like you said, term limits could be changed so you stay on the federal bench, but not uh, on the Supreme Court. Um, I know that the Constitution also says that justices have to be in good standing. And I think that's questionable if you have justices that, say, deceive the public on precedent or in their confirmation hearings, or, say, justices that are married to insurrectionists and ruling on insurrectionists from the bench. Um, You have a suggestion, I think they could quite easily accomplish quite quickly in Congress, that would create a regulation for the court that says all decisions involving constitutional matters must be decided on consensus with no fewer than seven out of the nine votes so it has to be a like an actual consensus rather than just majority sentiment where the six right-wing justices can just run roughshod over the rest of the justices you pointed out that fdr uh proposed that justices who were over 70 should be moved to an emeritus status right so they can participate in the deliberations but they no longer have a vote or if all all, one vote or they could collectively have one vote if they all agree Um, But at the very least, Congress needs to pass a law to make sure that the Supreme Court has to follow the same ethics rules as all the other federal justices, right? Which they currently don't have to do. There's like literally no one monitoring them. And the Federalist Society knew that when they made this focus, the justices. They made a deal with the devil to have Donald Trump as their leader because they were like the court, the court, the court. And they've done incredibly well with that kind of single-minded focus, right? You've made actually another really cool idea that was like everything should be televised so we see what's going on and less shadow docket where we actually have to see arguments and deliberations and putting it out in the light like that would increase the power of the people who dissent we would hear what they say but it would also raise the integrity of the entire process right yes and and congress should outlaw the shadow docket yeah i agree where i was going when when we started with the you know what can we do yeah. um was what happened in 1937 at franklin roosevelt uh, you know the, the supreme court was preparing to strike down social security as being unconstitutional they had already struck down child labor laws they had already struck down unemployment insurance they they had struck down a whole bunch of other more minor pieces of uh, the new deal and so fdr just went to the people he said okay you know, you just described what his proposal was, you know, the every and, and I think four out of the uh, four or five of the members of the court at that point in time were over 70, maybe more. I'd have to go back and look. And and uh, so he said, you know, let's do this. And what happened was there was this huge discussion, this huge national discussion about the Supreme Court. And, and people were, you know, in 1937, again, discussing you know, the, 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 the Dred Scott decision, the, the Marbury versus Madison decision. I mean, people were, people were going back to this stuff and the pressure on the court was so great that uh, Justice, Justice Owen Roberts finally changed, changed his vote. It became known as the, as the switch in time that saved nine. And uh, as opposed to stitch, you know, the old I get it, I get it. And he switched his vote and that was, you know, that was the end of the court going after uh, Franklin Roosevelt. And then, you know, by, by the time he, Roosevelt died. He'd appointed, uh, I think, all but one, maybe oh, all of the members. Holy of the Lord! Um, but you know, the point is that it, what the Biden administration needs to do is something huge, or propose is something huge that will produce that political explosion, that will then provoke that conversation, that national discussion about the role of the court, about the power of the court. Do we want to have nine unelected people basically ruling our country as if they are kings and queens? Or do we want to have an actual court system? Is is the Supreme Court a co-equal part of government? If they're co-equal, well, first of all, they're not. The Constitution makes that clear. They're subordinate to Congress. But even if they were co-equal, that doesn't mean that they can say to Congress, you can't pass that law or to the president. Yeah, you signed it, but, you know, it, it's not going to get enforced. Uh, you know, so, yeah, we've got a lot of work to do. But the main thing to get there, in my opinion, is to begin a national conversation. And typically what starts those conversations is a, you know, a presidential proclamation of some sort. Right. It, because it is, it's an actual crisis that we're in. And ultimately it's not these nine people making the decisions. It's the people that put those people in power, especially the people who put those six people in power. Because I mean, 
Amy Coney Barrett is not, she should not be sitting on the Supreme Court. She was not prepared to be that kind of a justice. She was put there for a reason. So it's not Amy Coney Barrett making the decision. It's whoever put her there to make decisions that we need to deal with. And I think that ultimately comes back to money in the court, right? Like if we say the court itself basically invented this idea that money equals speech and then that money equals speech basically built this court. And I think we have to take a broader picture of it. And like you said, the Biden administration needs to really take this seriously. If we can make it through this election, I think this is the thing they need to uh, address moving forward. Yeah. And we have 13 circuits. I mean, you know, uh, we didn't back in the day. Yeah. Um, at the very least, team. we could expand it to 13. Yeah. Yeah. At the very least. Well, I would love to talk to you more. Honest to God, there's so much I could talk to you about. Um, we could go into great detail about Citizens United and how it didn't just buy our government for the richest and shut the rest of us out, but it threw open the doors to, you know, foreign interference and government propaganda and foreign propaganda. And we could talk about the problems with our press, the bastardization of the idea of free speech, the growth of propaganda that's meant to divide us forever and how well it's working. We could talk about all the pitfalls of government itself, right? How America is so much bigger now than it was when it was created and we wrote we wrote the Constitution and how the Electoral College favor in the Senate, favor rule in Red America and how the filibuster doubles down on that minority power. But I'm just going to have to have you come back, right? Okay. So I think, I think we can start to see that the work that needs to be done if Democrats win to find our way back to a government for the people, by the people. Yeah. But before you go, what, what should people, what should we do if we lose? What should people be holding on to today or this week uh, if we end up watching democracy sort of slipping through our fingers? Can we leave people with something hopeful? Democracy is an extraordinary idea. It is, it is built on something that is wired into not just all humans, but all mammals. Um, if you've ever watched a school of fish or a flock of birds, it looks like they're communicating telepathically. But what's actually going on is each wing beat, each tail flip uh, as, they're, as they're swimming or flying is actually a vote. And when more than 50% of the flock or of the school of fish votes to move a quarter inch to the right, the whole group goes a quarter inch to the right. It's just amazing. I mean, we're, we're wired this way. All animals are right down to ants and bees. And you ever see a ball of gnats in the air? I mean, they're all, they're literally voting and it's majority rule. And they're and, voting to fly into my face, those gnats. Yeah, they that. actually are. Yes. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and, and this, I mean, this is wired into us and, you know, as, as is fairness. I mean, walk into a first grade class with a big box of cookies and give one to each kid and 10 to, to, to another kid and, and just watch what happens. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it, it, we are wired for democracy. And it's deep within us. It's, it's part of, of the, the nature of most indigenous societies around the world, all the ethnographies that you know, look back at that. And it's been something that we've always aspired to. I don't believe that a Republican victory, no matter how fascist they may be, or no matter how you know, uh, much they may clamp down on a, on a handful of states or whatever, I don't think that that's going to take that away. It's not going to end the, the ideal of democracy. It's not going to end the love of democracy that is deep within all Americans and frankly, within humans all around the world. The problem, of course, is that once you get a fascist into office, it's almost impossible to extract them. Just ask yeah. any draft age man in Russia or any woman in Iran. Uh, so the challenge is to keep the fascists from gaining power. Uh, but, you know, hey, if, if the fascists win, um, you know, and, and of course, the, the, what this election is all about from their point of view is setting up 2024 for the yeah. big win. Yeah. But if they win, we continue to fight. We yeah. continue to educate. We continue to talk. We continue to share with other people. We tend to continue to build community. We continue to, to organize ourselves and our institutions as democratically as we possibly can. And we continue to share the story about the history of this country and, and the, the incredible sacrifices that people have made for, for you know, 250, well, 250 years, really, in a, in a big way, to, to achieve this goal of democracy. And, you know, no matter how, what kind of success these guys have, and, and it's going to be substantial because they now have a neo-fascist billionaire class supporting them, and they're just yes. buying elections. They're pouring. This is going to be a $9.5 billion election. And, and we've got something like 400 American billionaires that have put money into this thing, hundreds of millions of dollars, probably billions of dollars. Yeah, they're building an oligarchy. 
and, yeah, they, and a well, government yeah, that will they, support they, the oligarchy. Them, yeah, absolutely. But, uh, you know, I'm not going to let it knock me down. I'm not going to let it make me feel bad. I'm, I'm, I will let it get me pissed off. <laughs> I will let it get me motivated. But uh, that's that's my take on it, Lee. Oh, that's good. I think we want to remind people that the election is not the final act. It Whether it goes the right way or it goes the wrong way, it is the opening act to the next uh, battle and the next thing. And as you remind us, like humans, animals, we innately know that alone we're weak, but united we're strong. And yeah. we move together as a group, right? So our need for community has been weaponized against us, but I think we could weaponize it against um, those who would take from us. So I want to thank you so much for joining me today, Tom. I'm such a fan of your work. Your mind is a gift to the rest of us, and I hope you will join me again. And I hope that when that happens, I'm speaking to you from America that is on the path back to sanity and not the path to chaos that we will work through. But thank you so much for being here with me today. My pleasure, Lee. Thank you so much for inviting me. So that was Tom Hartman, number one progressive radio host, best-selling author, and political expert, giving us some insight on the challenges America must confront post this election. The Republicans know they no longer have the majority sentiment in the country, so they are rigging the election system and using their captured Supreme Court to make sure they don't have to win to rule. Between the six far-right activist justices making decisions in the shadows, the gerrymandered states, the corrupt state legislatures, and the upcoming Moore v. Harper case, which would take the presidency permanently out of the hands of the Democrats, the Biden government must see this moment for the constitutional crisis it is, and after the election, deal with the court using Congress, the deliberative body that was always meant to keep it in check. If we want to stay a functioning country, America needs our laws to reflect the will of the people. And I think the majority of us would agree that nine unelected people shouldn't get to decide how it all works. There is literally nothing in the Constitution that gives the Supreme Court the exclusive right to decide what the Constitution says or impose it on America. And we need to remind them of that. I want to thank Tom for joining me today and you for caring enough about democracy to be here. No matter how this goes, we rise and we fall together. Whether we win or lose, the work is not done. So hold your head high. Until next week, PGF. The Politics Girl podcast is written and performed by me, Lee McGowan, in partnership with the Midas Media Network and produced and edited by Happy Warrior Entertainment. All rights reserved.